Welcome to Genesis Metro. Let's give it up for the band leading us in worship. I hope that you were able to sing those last lines of that song um, this week. I hope that was an anthem for your life, that you sought the Lord and he answered. If you walked in here this week and that has not been your anthem, I hope that we can get you there by the end of today's service. Um, I struggled with the title for today's message, um, but I think we're going to land on it wasn't a mistake. And um, we've been going through the story of Joseph, and just to catch everybody up, Joseph was born the 11th out of 12 children to one of the patriarchs in the Bible named Jacob. And Jacob had a very colorful story in which he was a, a wrestler, if you will, with God, and ultimately allowed God to prevail in his life, and he became Israel, which means God prevails. And then after that, he had all of his children, and a lot of amazing things happened in their lives, but he gave this coat to the 11th child named Joseph, and, and that caused jealousy to arise with his brothers, so much so that they considered killing him, but they did not think there was any profit in that, so they sold him instead. And the whole rest of the story is unfolding how Joseph's life went from place to place, and he ended up in Egypt, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and then he was elevated to the most powerful person perhaps on the planet at that time, an arc that only God could orchestrate. And today, as we look at this story, we have learned that his brothers have already gone back once and received some grain, but uh, Joseph kind of held one of their brothers as a hostage, and his name was Simeon. And so Simeon is in prison, and the brothers take the grain back because there's this incredible famine going on. And, and on their way back, they realize that the silver that they had taken down to Egypt was actually put back in their bags. And they fear that it's going to appear that it was stolen. And so they don't want to go back and talk to Joseph, who is representative of Pharaoh. They, they just want to, you know, move on. But the problem is they left Simeon down there and... Joseph told them they couldn't return unless they brought his youngest brother, Benjamin. And Benjamin was his blood brother. All the rest of these are half-brothers to Joseph. And so that's the bargaining chip that was required for them to return. Jacob, the father of all these boys, and if you have more than one boy, you know you know what it's like. I mean, it is a constant, you don't know what is going to happen if you have multiple boys in the house. I mean, anything is possible. Uh, I feel like every time we sing that song, you know, it's like, that's true in a different way. Um, but, but anyway, uh, Jacob is like, why would I send, and he kind of says it in a way that, like in today's parenting, we wouldn't say it. <laughs> he said, why would I send my other son and so it's like, he's kind of saying, Joseph and Benjamin are my real sons, <laughs> and all the rest of you are kind of not. Anyway, he, 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 he's upset, right? And sometimes we say things as parents and we're upset, but, but you kind of hear it, and you're like cringe, like, oh, probably shouldn't say that one, Jacob. Anyway, um, but, but anyway, the, the, the concept remains that he's like, I'm not sending anyone back. I've already lost Joseph, and now I've lost Simeon. And you want to take my baby? You know, you want to take Benjamin back down? There? No. And he, I think he probably said an extra word. Not just no, but, you know, heck no. Yeah, that's the one. Anyway, uh, so today we're going to be talking about, you know, what happens when the grain runs out? What happens when the little bit that we talked about last week, what happens when it runs out? And is all of these, are all of these things happening on accident? Or is their divine design wrapped up? And as you think about it, I encourage you always to translate it, and we try to do a good job of that for you, into your life. What happens when the grain runs out at your house? What happens when the love runs out at your house? What happens when the patience runs out, when the money runs out? What happens when it's 100 degrees for 70 days? What happens? People get a little on edge, all right? So uh, we got five days of 90s. Let's enjoy it. Get out there. Have a lawn party. Yeah, let's do it. Everybody at the Bourne's house Tuesday night. Um, <laughs> that's funny. 
Uh, but anyway, whenever we think about whenever the grain runs out, it, it, we come to a moment of decision. Like, are we going to turn to God or are we going to die in our pride? And that's really your two options when you get to this point. And God has shown me over the years so many times. God has taught me humility. God has taught me that I don't, in fact, know all the answers. And that's a hard one for me because I feel like I do. Anybody else? Like, given enough time and resources, we can figure it out. You know. You know who you are, my friends. Um, but occasionally I've run up against problems and, and God sends a messenger, Right? And I can tell you two brief stories to kind of whet the appetite. Uh, you know, about 18 years ago, as we were into this 20-year process, there was a little old lady that was on the mission committee of First Baptist Church, Frisco. And she was driving down two-lane El Dorado, two-lane El Dorado, before a target, before a tollway even existed. There was no anything, nothing. You look out there... There was nothing out there, okay? Just when you go outside our building today and you just look to the west, there was nothing out there. Just corn, okay? I get a phone call one day, and it was a little lady named Janelle Boyce. Um, I won't forget that name. And she called me up, and she said, um, is this Pastor Tim? And I was like, yes, it is. And she said, um, I was driving down El Dorado, and I just felt like I had a vision from God. Now... I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm going to be really honest with you. When people start a conversation with me like that, I would love to tell you that because I'm a pastor that I translate it into like Jesus speak. But I'm going to tell you, you start a conversation like that with me, and I'm going to think right out of the gate, you're crazy, okay? <laughs> I mean, like if we don't know each other, you know, I'm just, you know, if, you, if someone came up to you and said, hey, God told me something, I'm going to tell you. I, you'd be naive and borderline foolish if you ever were just like, yeah, tell me what it is. Um, and so I, I was like, okay. And she's like, I was driving on El Dorado, and, you know, uh, God told me that there needed to be a church right here. And she didn't know that we had been looking at that piece of property already. And I was like, I couldn't agree with you more. And she goes, well, I know the guy that owns that land. And I was like, I'm interested now. <laughs> Starting to develop here, I see. She goes, and I'm going to talk to him. And I'm going to ask him if he would let you build your church on that piece of property. And I was like, you go do that. And you let me know how that goes. Anyway, long story long, you know, 18 years, you know, about four weeks, we're going to move in to that piece of property. And time would fail us if I were to tell you all of the twists and turns and crazy things that have led to this moment. I mean, I couldn't, you wouldn't even believe me half the stuff that I would tell you that was wrapped up in that whole story. But I can tell you that that lady called me and she said she had a vision. And in about four weeks, her vision is going to come to pass. And I learned that God is not making mistakes when he sends messengers to tell you something that you yourself could never, ever make come to pass. So for anyone that is in a season where your grain is about to run out, I hope that I can help you today to let you know that God is sending you a message, a very clear message that if you would seek the Lord, he would answer you. And though it might look impossible, nothing is impossible for the Lord. And the church said, amen. All right, now I'm going to try to preach, but I feel like that was a good warm up. It says in Genesis 43, this is where we left off last week. And you're going to say, well, didn't you read that verse last week? Yes, I did. Um, now the famine was still severe in the land, so that when they had eaten all the grain they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go back and buy us a little more food. Now I'm going to quote the, 
illustrious theologian Taylor Swift, Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes. Yes, yes. Can we all say it together on the count of three? One, two, three. Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes. Okay, I see. Uh, I was going to sing it, but y'all just wanted to talk it. Anyway, here is Jacob with an incredibly large problem. And there are no finite answers to infinite issues. There, there's nothing that you can do in the temporal that is going to solve the eternal. And many times we are literally trying to put band-aids on bullet holes. Here he's got a need for a whole nation of people. And yet he's wanting just a little bit more grain. A little bit more is not going to solve the problem. God has put us in a problem that we need God to get out. Actually, I should say that differently. Uh, we have put ourselves in a problem through sin that God is trying to get us out of. And it is an, an infinite and an eternal issue. And if we ever try to solve an eternal issue with a temporal solution, it's always going to come up short. You see, you have to have an infinite and eternal answer to an infinite and eternal problem. And Jesus is the only infinite and eternal answer to man's greatest infinite and eternal problem, sin. So we have to have Jesus because we can't solve that problem on our own. We are literally trying to take these temporal things like money or pleasure or status or relationships and we're trying to plug them in to the solution that will never solve the riddle. And so I encourage you today, if you haven't considered the answer to your eternal issue of sin, that you might think about you're running out of grain. That every day you're running out like the sands of the hourglass are flowing down and the only answer is Jesus. The only way to find peace is Jesus. The only way to find hope is Jesus. And so here is Jacob running out of grain and that's forcing him into a decision. It's amazing how God uses our circumstances to push us toward answers. If you either have Really, you could say you either have an eternal answer or you have empty air. I don't know if you've ever tried to grasp empty air. <laughs> you're trying to reach for it. Sometimes that's what it feels like when you're running out of grain. It's like you're just grasping in the air, but you can't get a hold of anything. I hope today that you might realize that there is something real. There is something tangible. There is a bedrock that you can put your feet on and know that it's going to be secure underneath your feet. And that is, obviously, the Word of God. It says that the grain was running out, and he wanted them to go back and get a little bit more. It says, but Judas said to him, the man warned us. The man, <laughs> the man is uh, Joseph, okay, his brother, but he doesn't know it's Joseph yet. He said, the man warned us solemnly, you will not see my face again unless your brother, Benjamin, is with you. If you will send, your brother, send our brother along with us, we will go down and buy food for you. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. Because the man said to us, you will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. Israel asked, why did you... Every parent better say amen on this. Why did you bring this trouble on me? <laughs> why did you do this? Has anybody ever like looked at a three-year-old and said that? Anyway... <laughs> Like they're going to give you this like a uh, Socrates level answer, you know, and they got nothing, right? They're like, I don't know. Every, every child, you know, teenager, you know, like, why did you do that? I, we went over, we told you not to, you said you were going to be, uh, uh, and they just all have that blank look. Uh, uh. And like, come on, just give me something. This is Jacob with 12 sons. You know how many times he's had this conversation in his life? Why did you bring this trouble on me by telling the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us closely about ourselves and our family. Is your father still living? He asked us. Do you have another brother? We simply answered his questions. How are we to know? He would say, bring your brother down here. Um, set, point number two, are you hungry enough to hear what God has to say? Are you hungry enough to hear what God has to say. See, I think sometimes the problem is you're not hungry enough yet. That the grain hasn't got low enough yet for you to want to hear 
what he has to say. I'm going to call upon my illustrious friends from the movie Remember the Titans, and we say this at my house all the time. Whenever someone is being stubborn, we say, he don't want to know, Blue. And so just watch this with me real quick. We're full tonight, boys. What? There's tables all over the place, man. What are you talking about? Well, this is my establishment. I reserve the right to refuse service to anybody. Yeah, that means you too, hippie boy. Now, y'all want something to eat, you can take these boys out back and pick it up from the kitchen. <clears throat> What'd I tell you, Yo, man? Come on, Petey, man! Petey, I, I didn't know, man. I told you! What you mean you didn't know? What, you think I was playing man, with you? Man, he ain't know. Petey, what's Blue, he don't want to know. Man, you pull Blue, he don't want to know! <laughs> Man, I hope, man, that guy's a punchable face, that bartender, doesn't he? Could you just punch that guy in the face? In the name of Jesus, of course, but <laughs> I think for, you know, people like that, I think it's loud. Anyway, so whenever someone, you're trying to explain to them, and I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone that you can tell by their posture, and you can tell by the way they respond, you can tell by... Like they start robo-questioning and, and angling and obfuscating and all the things, you know, that they don't, they're not trying to get on the train. Does anybody ever, like, anybody know what I'm talking about? Give me a little, like, nonverbal feedback. You know what I'm, like, you, the, the answer is obvious, the problem is obvious, the solution is obvious. I mean, you know, all the ingredients are there for a change to occur. No one's in disagreement about the facts, and yet the person just is unwilling, and we always... In, in my household, they say it all, everybody says it to one another. They say, you don't want to know, Blue. You don't want to know. And, and every coach, <laughs> every coach in here, every boss in here, every parent in here has this feeling at times that this person is just unwilling to listen. Like, every coach, like, you can run the play. And anybody that played football, all my football players in here, raise your hand just real quick, okay? Football is a very complex sport. Because you have 22 pieces moving at the same time on any given play. And that's what makes it very unique. It's a very unique sport. And um, it would be amazing to me. Now, I, I will say another stereotype. Football players are not known to be smart. And the church said, Amen. I mean, it's just, it's just now I was a, a, a 4.0 student, right? And so I would be amazed how oftentimes we'd be out there and the guy's just like, he has to block down. When you get in this formation, you've got to block down and you've got to, and like every, like we could run it five times. And the same guy is doing the same wrong thing. And the coaches are going out of their mind. Did you not hear me? Everybody, give me 50 push-ups right now. And you get back up, and the guy, okay, now run it again. Dude runs the same direction. He's like, all right, now we're going to do up downs. We're going to go across. We're going to run around the lap, go around the track. And I'm just sitting there like, why can't, why can't you just do what he's telling you to do? It wasn't rocket science. It was like, you run over there, hit that guy. I'm just saying that that guy apparently needed some more pain before he was willing to hear what the coach was saying. Remarkably, the, the pain threshold would be reached and compliance would be achieved. Are you hungry enough yet to hear what God is trying to say to you? Or would you like him to dial it up? Another notch. Just read through the Bible and figure out how high God can take this thing. What happens when the grain does run out? What happens when you find yourself out there all alone, isolated? Not because God wanted you there, but because you refused to listen. I promise you, if you get hungry enough, you'll be willing to hear what he has to say. Judah understood the dilemma. We're going to call this point, it is what it is. Judah said, <laughs> the word 
from the man was clear. He couldn't have been more clear. In the words of Tom Cruise and a few good men, should I have the court reporter read it back to you? I said, was it crystal? He said, crystal. Crystal clear. Crystal. He said, you cannot see the man unless Benjamin is brought back. You see, if we put Joseph in the place of God and use a similitude, stretch out some systematic theology on top of it, and what you would have is that the man is God's authority and God's word is immutable. And if you're not an accountant um, or a, a lawyer, you might not use that word. Immutable means that it doesn't change. It doesn't change. Over time, it doesn't matter if you go 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. Look at your face in the mirror. It is not immutable. It has changed, I assure you. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I just feel like, I got old, man. I just got old. Anybody else had that realization? It'll come, trust me. <laughs> Our bodies are not immutable. Our bank account is not immutable. Life in and of itself is not immutable. The only unchanging thing in this world over the last 7,000 years is God's word. It's immutable. Because it's immutable, it's unchangeable. Because it's immutable and unchangeable, it is also non-negotiable. You see, Judah was saying, it is what it is, Dad. It is what it is. And if you're walking in here this morning wanting to negotiate with God's word, then you're like, Jacob, talking to Judah, like, why did you even answer these questions? Why did you? <laughs> and you're like trying to, to figure a way out of facing what God's word is saying to you. And it doesn't matter if you come back next week, if he doesn't come, if you come back in five weeks, you come back in a hundred weeks. It's immutable. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through me. It is immutable. There are not many ways. There are not multiple ways. There are not multiple denominations in heaven. There's Jesus and us worshiping the God of heaven. And I wish the church just knew that today. I just wish the church could understand that today. That Jesus unites us, man. Come on. If you're trying to negotiate with God what his word says... I hope you would hear Judah. I hope you would hear Judah's voice this morning telling you, hey, it is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You don't have any leverage. It is what it is. And if you would humble yourself and surrender to the fact that it's God's word, it's God's word, then I promise you, we could get your life on track so quick if you would quit arguing with the word. Understand, you might have a problem with me as the purveyor of truth because I'm a man. I'm fallible. I am. I, I, I sin on a regular basis. I try not to, but I do. I do. As a parent, my children make me angry. And sometimes Carrie isn't perfect either. Um, and then I pastor all of you, and I... <laughs> It's like herding cats, you know. Sometimes it wears on me. And all I'm saying is what brings me back and what centers me is that God's word is unchanging. And if God said, even while they were yet sinners, Christ died for them, the just for the unjust, and that he loved us at our lowest, wouldn't that change your ability to dwell in the negativity when he says that you're to love your wife the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, are you loving like that? Are you self-sacrificing husbands, fathers? Are you setting the tone of spirituality and spiritual direction for your family? You see, the word is our regulator. And when you get out of bounds and when things get messed up, I promise you, it's because you're sitting there arguing with the word. You're trying to say, God, but I want to do it my way. He said, it is what it is. You adapt. He does not. Then I want us to look at the questions real quick. That's what 
Jacob didn't like. <laughs> it's like, why did, you, why did you even tell him these things? Well, he was asking us questions. We've kind of had a theme running for the, the la- better part of the last year that when God is asking questions, right, he's not asking questions. Like when he asks you a question, <laughs> it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He's trying, to, he's trying to do something inside of this question. I wanted to look at a couple of quick examples to try to lay the, the foundation out there a little bit more clearly. Number one, there's the question of correction. Whenever Adam and Eve had original sin, they partake of the fruit, Satan tempted them, and next thing you know, now they've, they're fallen. Now, they were naked before the fall, and there was no problem. But then they were naked after the fall, and what sin does is it twists and warps the thing that was good, and it makes the thing that was good now tainted with evil. So they put these fig leaves on, and they heard the voice of God. Now imagine, now you just got, remember you guys got to go there with me. We're talking this is Eden, all right? And I don't know what your Eden is. I don't know if it's like the Rocky Mountain cool breeze summer. I don't know if it's Southern California where it's 75 all day. I don't know if it's like St. John's out on a beach. In the, I don't know what your Eden is, but just imagine Eden and perfect. And you and your wife are naked and there's no one else around. That's, that's a good life. That's a good life, all right? It's a good life. And the church said, thank you, brothers in the house. Anyway, and all of a sudden you hear the voice of God coming. Now you just sinned. No one else has ever sinned. You don't even have, you don't have the reference point. Like we've all sinned and then we're like, God, I'm sorry. That's never happened. No frame of reference whatsoever of how to even approach asking God to forgive you. Just, just wrap your mind around it for just a second, okay? Go there with me, okay? And like you hear this, <laughs> you hear this voice that you've had conversations with. That it was all great, you're on good terms, and all of a sudden you hear this voice, and it says that they ran from the one that they used to love. The one that created them, they ran from him. And then you hear this voice, where are you? And they're like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like sometimes people walk in here, and like you thought it was just going to be another Sunday, and then God's like, I see you. <laughs> I have a sermon prepared just for you. <laughs> I, told him to tell, I told him to tell you these things, and now he's just going to unravel your life, and you'll be laid bare in front of everyone. That's embarrassing. Yes, it is. But God is trying to get our attention. Where are you? Where are you? And they said, well, we, we were naked, and so we hid from you. Who told you that you were naked? You ever had your mom and dad say a question like that? Like, uh, so what happened here? Are you asking because you don't know, parents? Like the teacher already told you, did something happen at school today? Every now and then I do this one for fun, parents. Do th- I promise you this works. I don't know anything. And I say, is there anything that you need to tell me? I just want to give you the opportunity. I didn't know. Is there anything that you need to tell me? And you would be amazed how many things I have found out (laughs) with just that simple question. Knowing nothing except that my children are sinners and that they hide things from me. Is there anything you want to tell me? Just before we get started here, I just want to know, is there anything you want to tell me? Sometimes they'd be like, no. And I was like, okay, good. And then they just walk away confused. (laughs) What does he know? What does he know? And I don't tell them until much later when they're adults. Anyway, two questions. And he asked them where they were and who told them they were naked. And those two questions were just to lead them to correction. Right? He wants to ask you, where are you this morning? Like he knows where you are, but where are you? Where are you spiritually? Where is your relationship at on the God spectrum? Where are you leading your children? When he says, who told you that you were naked? He's telling them, who told you to think the way that you think? Who changed your thought? Like, 
Just a couple of seconds ago, you thought about it this way, and now all of a sudden you're thinking about what I created, something completely different, something that was not what I intended, something that was not what I designed, and you're just coming up with your own stuff. You're just freestyling the way that you think. And you can then arrive at conclusions, try to justify your position, and you get so far from what God intended for your life. And you're hiding from the very being who knows what your purpose is and knows why he created. You're running from that this morning. Questions that lead to correction. Second level of questions are questions that were intended for reflection. There's a story of Jonah. I don't know if you know the story of Jonah, but Jonah was intended to preach to a, a bunch of pagans in a city called Nineveh. Nineveh was like a, like a Vegas, if you will, um, of today, and um, Jonah didn't want to go, and he tried to go his own way. God made a fish swallow him, spit him up. Anyway, he got him to where he wanted to go. Again, you know, we could do this the easy way, or we could do it the hard way. You know, I love that saying as a parent, you know, hey, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> you just tell me. You want it the easy way, or you want it the hard way. Anyway, so he gets to Nineveh, and he preaches, and here's where God's word is so good, and our staff will tell you that I like diatribe on God's word all the time. Like you can have the right message with the wrong hearted messenger and God save a whole city. Like that's how powerful his word is. How powerful his word was. Jonah walked up into Nineveh, preached a half hearted sermon that was, by the way, turn or burn. That was it. Like Hey, God's, hey, just letting you know, God's going to destroy you in seven days if you don't repent. And then he, like, walked out, you know? It's like, it's like and, like, Billy graham it, okay? These people, the whole city literally repented all the way up to the king with a half-hearted messenger, even though he had the right message from God. You want to know I have confidence on this stage? It's not because I'm the right messenger. It's because I got the right message and the church said, amen. <laughs> Jonah preaches the house down. Everyone gets saved and you'd think he'd be like, yes, I just literally led the biggest crusade of all time Mark it down for the history books, but instead he is upset. And he says to God, this is why, this is why I didn't want to come out here. This is why. I knew you were a compassionate God. I knew that you were merciful. And I knew that if they turned, you would save them. And now, looky there, you just saved them all. God says to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be angry? Just let me know when I get you. Do you do well to be angry? I'll say it a fourth time for the stubborn people. Do you do well to be angry? Is your life better because you're angry? Tell the whole story in a synoptic view God causes this plant to grow up that gives Jonah shade. And then he causes a wind to come up the same night and it destroys the plant. And then Jonah gets upset all over again and he even is really dramatic. He's like, God, why don't you let me die? I can't even enjoy my plant. And God asked him a second time, he says, do you do well to be angry for a plant? He said, you didn't work for that plant. You didn't water that plant. You didn't grow that plant. And it was here for just a moment. And then it perished. And yet you're upset over that. He said, should I not, God said, should I not be upset over the hundreds of thousands of souls that were in that city that were lost and in darkness and on the point of perishing for all of eternity? Should I not be upset about the things that last forever? And you're upset about the plant? You're mad because I had compassion? You're mad because I had mercy? A question of reflection. 
Maybe God might prick your hardened heart today and ask you, do you do well to be angry about the things that do not matter? And do you praise a God who has compassion even when it's on your enemies? Can you worship God and say that God, even though I don't understand it sometimes, even though it appears for a season that the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer, God, I know that your wisdom prevails. And who you have, who are, whomever you have mercy on, God, is whom you have mercy. I think that we should be really careful if we're ever sitting in the seat of judgment. If we're ever desiring for God to damn someone for all of eternity. I just would have a hard time believing that Jesus sits on the throne of your heart if you have that much hate in your life. A question of reflection. And the last question we'll cover is the question that is connected to what's possible. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus went into um, a house with some blind guys. And he asked this question. He said, do you, do you believe that I can do this? Man, what a question. Jesus is sitting there asking. Maybe, let me put it to you this way. I don't know, if you have a situation, just imagine you were in a situation. Your grain's running out. It's bigger than you could possibly imagine. Let's just imagine it was like a building that was supposed to cost like 12 to 15, and it cost 17. Let's just throw some hypotheticals out there, okay? And, and God sits down with you, and he looks you in the eye, and he says, do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that I can do this? And you're sitting there looking at Jesus, and your heart knows the right answer. But your head is sitting there going, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I do believe. But like, you can't really bring yourself to commit because there's a part of you that doubts. It'd be terrible if Jesus was sitting in here, this room, and you had this pressing need that was on your heart. And literally the God of eternity looks down and says, do you believe I can do this? And if you stutter and you stammer and you're like, oh, uh, these two blind guys, they said, yes, we believe that you can do this. He said, according to your faith, be it done. So their faith in Jesus allowed their eyes to be opened and the church said, amen. Hey, what if someone had their eyes opened in here? Do you believe that he can do this? Do you believe? I don't know if you believe because it doesn't appear you do. Do you believe he can do this? Now think it's just a one, it's not a monologue. We're dialoguing here, man. The shepherd with the sheep. We're having a conversation. I'm trying to take you over here to this grass. I'm not going to pick it up and put it in your mouth. You've got to get down there and get it. <laughs> All these questions are leading Jacob to a conclusion. These questions are giving Jacob and his family directions towards the God dream. And the only question that has to be answered this morning is, are you hungry enough? Jacob, are you hungry enough? To hear what God is trying to tell you. He responds, he says, Then Judah said to his father, Send the boy with me. We will be on our way so that we may live and not die. Neither we nor you nor our children. Now I could go off there about there's generations at stake when you're running out of grain. When you're running out of time. You don't have forever. I promise you, you're going to blink and they're going to be gone. Neither we nor you nor our children. I will be responsible for him. You can hold me personally accountable. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, I will be guilty before you forever. Judah, just remember, was the one that suggested they sell Joseph. And now Judah is taking on accountability for his youngest brother, Benjamin. He says in verse 10, if we had not wasted time, we could have been, we could have come back twice by now. I want to stop there just for a second before we get to our conclusion. If we had not wasted time, that one stuck out to me. If we had not wasted time, he's like, he's having to correct his dad, but doing it in a very respectful way. 
if we had not wasted time, Dad, we could have already been there and back. Now, for bonus points, who was the brother that was waiting in Egypt that they had to trade for the grain? Does anybody remember the name of him? Simeon. Man, you guys did a great job. Some of you get a gold star. That's 2%, 2% off your tithe for one month, okay? <laughs> if we had not wasted time, we could have gotten Simeon back. Now, what if I told you that Simeon's <clears throat> name means to hear and to obey? What, what if I told you that their ability to hear and to obey was in a prison in Egypt where God was trying to get them. And until they were willing to obey on this end, they were never going to get to the God dream on the other end. And when they get back, they're going to set Simeon free and their ability to hear and obey. What God is trying to do is all going to be revealed. But they're sitting there wasting time, sitting where they're comfortable, waiting for their grain to run out. Come on, I'm telling you, your Simeon is locked up. And you're never going to get him out until you're willing to do what God's word says. It is what it is. It is immutable. It is unchangeable. Therefore, it is non-negotiable. And some of you are sitting in this room right now waiting for the perfect season, waiting for the perfect time. And that when our kids get there, and when I get over here, when we get over that house, and when we get to this promotion, and then I'll serve the I'll tell you, it's right now that God wants your attention. What if I told you that Simeon's freedom was on hold because of the disobedience of his father? What if someone's waiting in a prison cell and their freedom, their opportunity for freedom is, is resting on your obedience today? See, I believe we're going to see the captive set free at 3330 El Dorado. You guys believe that? I believe that. Sure. It's been our obedience today. It's been our obedience for the last four years. That's going to unlock those opportunities tomorrow. Never forget what you do impacts eternity. Don't waste time. Don't waste time when God says move. When God puts a number on your mind, don't waste time. When God puts a word in your mouth, don't waste time. When God puts a name in your brain, get out your phone and text that person. Say, hey, God just put you, put you on my heart today. Just wanted to reach out. I can't even tell you how many times I've done that. And the person said, you know what? I was really just thinking. Da -da -da -da. You don't know. 18 years ago, Janelle Boyce had a name on her brain, had a vision from God, and she reached out. And I would have never been on that track. I would have never gotten to that place without a word from someone with a vision. And I immediately obeyed the message. I did not negotiate with the message. I surrendered to a message that I could not make come to pass. And we close. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags. Now here we're going to hear some Jacob, because he's getting ready to start wheeling and dealing, okay? <laughs> he said, put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take it down there to the man as a gift. A little balm, a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. He's like, we're going to give him some perfume and some pistachios, and we're going to buy our way out of this. Oh, my gosh. He said, take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was uh, put back into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps, perhaps it was a, perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and go back to the man at once. Are we pinning our hopes on pistachios this morning? Is, it, is that the way you're looking at your faith? Is that the, like, you know what? You're going to come to God, and you're going to bring him your best, because that's what Cain did. Cain brought God his best. God is never looking for your best. You see, there's a difference between uh, what we would call, uh, what's the word for it? Whenever you repay something, I have it down here, restitution. If you steal from someone, 
and you're found guilty, you have to restore it. That's called restitution. Restitution is you paying for your crime. When we put restitution before reconciliation, we're saying that we're going to work off our debt and we're going to earn our reconciliation. As Jacob is trying to bargain for God's grace, he says, you know what? You take double and you take the best of what we got and then you go down there and negotiate with the man. Now, if Joseph is the archetype of Christ, of God, they're bringing their best in exchange for the grace that he is going to give them. Can I tell you that that's an inverted process? That reconciliation has to occur before restitution. We only do restitution out of gratitude for the reconciliation. Once I'm right with God, I then serve him not to work off my debt, but because he forgave me my debt. You see, Jacob was saying, maybe, perhaps, it was a mistake. What if I told you this morning, it's not a mistake, that grace doesn't make mistakes. It wasn't a mistake when Jesus walked up on the woman who was caught in adultery and he said, go your way and sin no more. The Lord Lord has forgiven you. That wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a mistake whenever Jesus took the paralytic that was lowered down to the roof and he said, take up your bed and walk. That wasn't a mistake. As a matter of fact, you could say that everything that Jesus did, it wasn't a mistake. It was on purpose. When he said to Judas, go ahead and do what you're going to do. Betray me for 30 pieces of silver. It was on purpose. When he said, Peter, Satan desires to sift you. But after it's over, you're going to lead my people and we're going to be reconciled. It was on purpose. He said, destroy this temple, put it in the ground, and three days later I'll raise it. It was on purpose. When he let himself be nailed to a cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was on purpose. When he said to Telestai, which is paid in full, all the sins, past, present, future paid in full it was on purpose when it says he breathed his last and he said end to your hands father I commit my spirit and he died it was on purpose when they put him in a grave and they rolled the stone in place and on the third day he rolled the stone and he walked out with his own power bringing himself back to life proving that he had power over sin, hell, and the grave. It wasn't a mistake. It was on purpose. You serve a God that's trying to get you on purpose this morning, and you're looking around at your circle, you're saying, you're saying what do I have to give to you, God? What can I, oh, you want some pistachios, God? <laughs> like, hey, you want some almonds? Can I throw in some perfume? Like, what do we got here? Like, you think God is going to let you pay for his grace? It wasn't a mistake. It was on purpose purpose. You walked in here today. It wasn't a mistake. It was on purpose. Are you hungry enough to hear what God's trying to say to you? We could get this reconciliation together today and the rest of your life you live out in gratitude, not servitude. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, God help us today. Help us today to hear your questions, God, and if there's something that we need to change, that we would surrender to your word. God, that we would worship you because you've given us your love letter. Your love letter gives us insight into eternity, that it answers our deepest needs. It corrects the things in our lives that cannot be corrected. It transforms the areas that are broken. It allows for generational change if we are willing to receive it. God, we thank you for the word that you've given us. We ask these things in your name. And the church said, amen. Would you stand up and worship with us?